On August 6, 2016, Sebastian De Leon was slumped in the backseat of a car heading to Orlando, Florida for a short vacation with his parents, Rafael and Brunilda. The drive from their home in Weston, Florida was only about three hours. But to 16-year-old Sebastian, the trip felt much longer. He had a lingering headache and his eyes felt itchy and sensitive. He drank some water, rubbed his temples, and focused on the soft rumbling of the car. Sebastian wondered if his headache might be from getting too much sun the day before, since he'd spent the whole day swimming with friends in a lake. But Sebastian worked most of the summer as a camp counselor, so he was outside all the time in the sun, and it never really seemed to bother him, so it didn't make sense to him why yesterday would be any different. Whatever the reason, Sebastian was just totally annoyed at feeling so out of it. He'd been looking forward to this trip to Orlando for weeks. Tomorrow, they had tickets to his favorite amusement park, and tonight they were staying at a nice hotel nearby. It seemed like the perfect dose of late summer fun before school started next month, but Sebastian was worried that he might not feel well enough to even enjoy it. Sebastian groaned, made a pillow out of his duffel bag, and tried to rest. Maybe by the time they got there, the worst of this would be over. But a couple hours later, Sebastian's head was still pounding as his father parked in front of their hotel. Sebastian's parents unloaded the car, and then they all headed up to their room. Sebastian's parents, Raphael and Brunilda, unpacked and got dressed for dinner, but Sebastian felt too dizzy to even think about food. So he crawled into bed and told his parents to go eat without him. He wasn't hungry. Sebastian curled up in the bed, put his blanket over his head, and hoped a good night's sleep would set him straight. But the next morning, Sebastian's head hurt even worse. And now his eyes were starting to ache as well. Even the soft glow of sunlight through the hotel window felt blinding. Sebastian asked his mom to please shut the blinds, but she told him they were closed. Plus, it was cloudy outside. Brunilda sat next to him on the bed and put her hand on his forehead to check if he was feverish. Sebastian winced in pain when she touched him. His skin felt prickly and hypersensitive. Even the bedsheet against his body was very uncomfortable. Sebastian tried to sit up and get out of bed, but the covers suddenly felt too heavy for him to even move. Sebastian felt confused and overwhelmed. He'd never felt so weak and uncomfortable before. It even felt hard to form clear thoughts. He heard his mom making a phone call, then his dad came in and sat beside him. Raphael told Sebastian they were going to take him to a nearby hospital. They had decided that his condition seemed too serious to wait until they got home to deal with. Sebastian's dad helped him get out of bed and get dressed. When his parents opened the hotel room door, Sebastian moaned in pain from the light and turned away. Even with his eyes closed, the light felt almost unbearable. His dad pulled a pair of sunglasses from his shirt pocket and put them on Sebastian's eyes. Then he helped him walk unsteadily down the hallway towards the parking lot. The family reached their car and Sebastian crawled into the back seat. He heard his parents whispering to each other as they drove away from the hotel. Then Sebastian slipped into a haze. That afternoon, a lab coordinator at the Florida Hospital for Children, named Sheila Black, was drinking coffee between tasks when she heard a knock at her door. It was an assistant nurse with a sample of spinal fluid and Sebastian's patient file. Doctors suspected the young man had meningitis, which is an inflammation of the spinal cord caused by a bacterial or viral infection. One of its most revealing symptoms is sensitivity to light. To test for this disease, Sheila needed to examine the sample of Sebastian's spinal fluid. Sheila thanked the nurse, took the sample to a microscope, and squeezed a dropper of the fluid onto a slide. Then she slid the slide beneath the lens and adjusted the focus. The first thing she saw was that Sebastian's spinal fluid was clear, not cloudy. Spinal fluid is usually clear, but it turns cloudy when it's infected by meningitis. Sheila made a note on the spinal fluid container that Sebastian tested negative for meningitis, but decided to keep studying his sample under the microscope a little bit longer. Overall, the sample looked the way it was supposed to. It was clear, colorless, and scattered with little white blood cells. And so Sheila really had no idea what could be making Sebastian so sick. She scanned through Sebastian's files looking for clues. She noted his age, 
but then read further to where it mentioned Sebastian had gone swimming in a lake the day before his symptoms started. Going swimming in a lake was not unusual for a Florida teenager, but Sheila had recently attended a seminar about a rare type of microorganism that lives in warm freshwater lakes. When that microorganism enters the human body, it could cause an infection that seems like meningitis, but it's actually much worse. An 11-year-old boy died from this microorganism infection at her hospital only two years before, and so Sheila had never forgotten how heartbreaking it felt to be so powerless as that young child slipped away. Sheila hoped her hunch was wrong, but there was only one way to find out. Sheila took another sip of coffee and then leaned in and peered into the microscope again. She stared at Sebastian's spinal fluid sample for a long, long time, looking for one telltale sign. She couldn't allow a repeat of what happened last time. Then, suddenly, Sheila saw a flicker of movement in the sample. She blinked and looked closer. It happened again. A tiny bulge on one of the white blood cells wiggled. Maybe these were not actually white blood cells. They were something else something alive. Maybe they were the very organism she was afraid that Sebastian could have been infected by. Sheila called Sebastian's doctor and told him what she'd just found. If this was what she thought it was, unfortunately, Sebastian was facing a death sentence. Sebastian's doctor, Humberto Liriano, slowly lowered the phone from his ear to his side and leaned his head against the wall. He felt crushed by Sheila's news. As a pediatrician who had treated some of the sickest kids, Dr. Liriano always tried to stay optimistic, even in the darkest times. But sometimes it was hard not to feel totally defeated. If Sheila's finding was accurate, Sebastian did not have much of a chance. Dr. Liriano had treated this same infection four other times, and in all four cases, none of the patients survived. Still, he felt a deep sense of duty to never give up. No matter how unlikely Sebastian's chance of survival was, Dr. Liriano resolved to fight with everything he had. He made some calls to get a team in place, and then he had Sebastian move to a room in the critical care unit, and then he went to study Sheila's lab results more closely. And right away, Dr. Liriano could tell from looking at Sebastian's spinal fluid that Sheila's fears were right. This was the worst-case scenario. But there was one ray of hope. Dr. Liriano had heard of a new medication designed to combat Sebastian's condition with this microorganism. It was named Impavido, Spanish for undaunted. But there was a catch. The drug was still undergoing safety review. The makers of Impavido were still negotiating with the Food and Drug Administration for approval to get wider distribution. So very few hospitals were able to stock it, including the Florida Hospital for Children. Dr. Liriano called the hospital's pharmacy. He told them he had a patient who urgently needed Impavido and to call everywhere until they found some. The pharmacist said they would and hung up. Dr. Liriano paced in his office, trying to think of how else he might be able to save Sebastian in case he couldn't get this medication in time. He knew of other patients who had died waiting for it to arrive. Just then, Dr. Liriano's phone rang. It was the hospital's pharmacy. They'd gotten in touch with the Centers for Disease Control, who had already tracked down the CEO of Impavido's manufacturer, which was based right in Orlando. And they apparently said that they had Impavido available and would be happy to supply the hospital with as much as they needed. Dr. Liriano felt a rush of joy at this news until the pharmacist finished their sentence. There was one problem. Impavido was stored in a safe at the CEO's office, and the CEO was out of town. Dr. Liriano groaned in frustration. He asked how long it would be until the CEO could make it back to the office. If the medicine didn't make it to the hospital soon, it would be too late to save Sebastian. The pharmacist said the CEO was away in Boston, Massachusetts through the weekend. There was basically no way he could make it back in time. But there was one other person who had access to the safe, the CEO's son, Michael. Not only that, but Michael was already on his way to get the Impavido for Sebastian. He would then personally rush it to the Florida Hospital for Children. Dr. Liriano was ecstatic to hear this, but none of it would matter if it took too long to deliver the drug. And so he asked where this office was 
to gauge how long Sebastian would have to wait. And the pharmacist's answer that the company's offices were only about 10 miles from the hospital nearly brought tears of joy to the doctor's eyes. After he hung up with the pharmacist, Dr. Liriano ran to the ER. When he got there, he assigned a nurse to wait by the entrance for the CEO's son, Michael, and the second he got there, this nurse was supposed to take the drug from him and rush it up to the critical care unit where Sebastian was. But there was still one other task that Dr. Liriano had to complete before they could institute this drug, and that was telling Sebastian's parents what was going on with Sebastian. Dr. Liriano steadied himself and then went down the hall to Sebastian's room. He peeked in at the doorway and saw Sebastian lying in bed, barely conscious. His parents, Brunilda and Raphael, sat on opposite sides of the bed, looking totally exhausted and terrified. Dr. Liriano stepped inside and then asked Sebastian's parents to please follow him out into the hall. Dr. Liriano could see in the parents' faces how much they were dreading whatever he was about to tell them. Once they were out in the hall, Dr. Liriano explained Sebastian's situation as clearly as he could. He said their son had caught an infection caused by a microorganism while he was swimming. And now this infection had spread deep into his body and his life was in danger. When he said this, the parents' faces went white. They stared at Dr. Liriano blankly. He told them the good news was that a new medication was on the way to the hospital this very second. The bad news was that Dr. Liriano had never been able to use this medication before, so he didn't know for sure if it would even work. Still, it was the best and potentially only chance they had against an infection with a very low survival rate. Only 3% of people who get this infection survive. Dr. Liriano gave the parents a few minutes to absorb this terrible news. Then he explained that in order to use this new medicine, they would have to put Sebastian into a medically induced coma, taking him to the brink of death in order to save his life. So if they wanted to say anything to Sebastian, now was the time. There might not be a later. Brunilda and Raphael nodded and went back into their son's room. They stood on either side of his bed and held his hands. His mother, Brunilda, cried as she told him what a perfect boy he was and that he was going to be just fine, medicine was on the way that would help him, and God was looking out for him. Sebastian's father, Raphael, made the sign of the cross and squeezed his son's hand. Then he leaned close to his face and told his son how strong he was, how he would beat this, and how they would all live a long, happy life together. Dr. Liriano was very moved by the parents and what they were saying to their son, but at some point, he stepped in and asked Brunilda and Raphael to please leave the room, and then he had his nurses prep Sebastian for the medically induced coma, which required them to drastically lower Sebastian's body temperature. The team jumped into action, prepping IVs and hooking Sebastian up to various monitors. Dr. Liriano made sure everything looked good and headed out to the reception desk to wait for the impavido. The whole floor was tense with anticipation. Then the elevator at the end of the hall dinged. Dr. Liriano heard rapid footsteps and suddenly a nurse sprinted around the corner holding a package. It was the impavido that Michael had brought. Dr. Liriano looked at his watch. He had called the pharmacy less than half an hour ago. Sebastian still had a chance. He ran back to Sebastian's room and quickly opened the container holding the impavido pills. Once Sebastian had taken them, an anesthesiologist sedated him. Within moments, Sebastian was asleep. A nurse gave him an IV drip of cold saltwater solution, while another wrapped him in frozen blankets. Dr. Liriano paced while keeping his eyes glued to Sebastian's monitor. This process would give the medication more time to work, but it was always very dangerous to cool a body so rapidly. Sometimes organs reacted very unpredictably. Within the hour, Sebastian's body temperature was down to 91 degrees Fahrenheit, and Sebastian was officially comatose. Once Sebastian's breathing began to slow, Dr. Liriano gently fed a tube down his throat to help his body maintain a steady flow of oxygen. So far, the procedure had gone exactly as planned. All they could do now was wait and hope. The next morning, Dr. Liriano had some more of Sebastian's spinal fluid drawn to assess how the impavido was doing, 
He took the fluid down to the lab and studied it under a microscope. And when he looked, he let out a sigh of relief. There were already far fewer tiny wriggling creatures in the sample. The infection had significantly reduced. By the following morning, Dr. Liriano was beginning to believe that Sebastian was actually going to make it. He found Sebastian's parents half asleep on a bench in the waiting room. They jolted awake when he spoke to them. Dr. Liriano told them he didn't want to celebrate too early, but so far, all signs were very positive. When the parents heard this, they cheered and hugged the doctor tightly. But Dr. Liriano made it clear that Sebastian was not out of the woods yet. They still would have to bring him out of the medically induced coma. Dr. Liriano's team began steadily warming Sebastian's body. Minute by minute, his temperature rose until finally he was back at the normal 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Dr. Liriano then removed Sebastian's breathing tube and then hovered at his bedside, waiting. Then it happened. Sebastian took a big gulp of air on his own and his heartbeat remained steady. Sebastian was out of his coma. A little while later, Sebastian's eyes blinked open. He gazed around the room like he'd just woken up from a deep sleep. Dr. Liriano immediately sent a nurse to go get his parents. Brunilda and Raphael rushed inside and threw themselves on their son. Everyone in the room clapped, cheered, and hugged. Dr. Liriano was ecstatic, but also stunned. This wasn't just a miracle, it made history. What Sheila Black found in Sebastian's spinal fluid should have killed him. It's a rare organism called Negleria fowleri that lives in warm, stagnant waters, exactly like the lake where Sebastian had been swimming. When infected water goes up a swimmer's nose, the microorganism then travels through the body to the brain. Once there, it attacks tissue, basically eating the victim's brain. This causes swelling that eventually shuts the brain down and the victim dies. That's why this organism is commonly known as the brain-eating amoeba. But what confirmed Sheila's hunch that this was a brain-eating amoeba was the organism's particular way of moving. It uses microscopic appendages to row itself like oars on a boat. That's why the microorganisms looked like they were wiggling under the microscope. In 57 years of documented brain-eating amoeba infections, Sebastian had become just the fourth person in the United States to survive after being attacked by them. Dr. Liriano told Sebastian's parents that their son had been both horribly unlucky, but also, at the same time, extremely lucky. Because if the medicine that ultimately saved his life had been stored basically anywhere else, he probably would not have gotten it in time. Of all the places in the world the medicine manufacturer's headquarters could be, they were also in Orlando, just a few miles from the hospital where Sebastian was. All told, it took less than 20 minutes for the CEO's son to rush and get the medicine and deliver it to the hospital. A few hours after coming out of his medically induced coma, Sebastian was able to speak again. It took two years for him to regain all his motor skills, but eventually he made a full recovery. And now for our second story, called Burning from the Inside. On a Sunday night just after Christmas in 2015, 27-year-old Kayla Hansen weaved through the crowded dining room of Grimaldi's, a popular Italian restaurant in Peoria, Arizona. The restaurant was unusually busy that night. As the manager, it was up to Kayla to keep things organized. So she was doing a little bit of everything, helping out the wait staff, checking on customers, and generally just making sure everything was running smoothly. For someone less experienced, this whole night might have been totally overwhelming. But Kayla was a veteran and workaholic who regularly put in 60 or 70 hour weeks. She was totally in her element. Closing time was fast approaching, so Kayla grabbed an order of pasta and raced out of the kitchen. As she crossed through the doorway, though, she let her guard down for a second and collided with one of her servers. The tray Kayla was carrying fell to the floor, and Kayla staggered back into the doorframe, and she grabbed the doorframe to steady herself, but before she could get her balance, the door swung back and smashed into her hand. Kayla cried out in pain and yanked her hand back. The server apologized and ran to get some ice, but Kayla waved her away. 
She wasn't bleeding, and she figured she just didn't have time to ice a minor injury like this. Kayla's hand was in a lot of pain, and she could feel it aching right away, but she shrugged it off and helped the waiter clean up the food that had spilled. Then Kayla finished up her shift and headed home, ready to get some sleep. The next morning, Kayla woke up and felt a throbbing pain in her right hand. She looked down and saw that it was totally swollen and the skin was bright red and tender. It didn't look good. Kayla groaned in frustration. She was supposed to meet her friends for a hike later, but as much as she wanted to ignore the pain in her hand, she knew she really needed to change her plans and go get her hand checked out by a doctor. So she texted her friends and said she would not be able to go on the hike that day, and then she called her primary care doctor and got an appointment for later that day. By the time Kayla got to the doctor's office that afternoon, her hand was really hurting. But when the doctor examined her hand, he told Kayla she had just bruised the soft tissue. Her hand wasn't broken, so the swelling would eventually go down and she'd be fine. Kayla was totally relieved to hear this. It would have been extremely difficult to work at the restaurant with a broken hand. So Kayla figured she'd get better in a couple of days and really just kind of stopped thinking about her hand. It still hurt, but it didn't feel like an urgent matter. Two weeks later, Kayla was in her bathroom getting ready for the day, trying to brush her hair with her uninjured left hand. Her right hand, the damaged hand, was still swollen and tender, even though it had now been two weeks since she hurt it. The swelling really had not gone down at all, and the pain seemed to be getting worse every day. In fact, the pain had gotten so bad on several days over these past two weeks that she'd had to call into work sick. Kayla could not afford to keep taking time off of work, so she was starting to feel really worried about her hand again. Kayla fumbled the brush and shook her head in frustration. Then, just kind of out of instinct, she picked the brush back up with her damaged hand. And as soon as she grabbed it, it felt like an electric shock ran up her right arm. Kayla immediately dropped the brush and then grabbed her injured hand. She could feel the skin was incredibly hot to the touch and it almost felt like it was on fire from the inside out. It was so painful. And now, also, her right arm hurt, too, and it was beginning to swell just like her hand. Kayla realized she just couldn't push through this pain any longer. It was horrible. And so she decided she would go back to her doctor. Later that day, Kayla was in her doctor's office as the doctor was examining her swollen right arm. It took Kayla everything she could not to scream out in pain every time the doctor very gently pressed her hand or arm. After the doctor finished his exam, he told Kayla that this was clearly more than just a bad bruise to her hand. But it was not clear to the doctor why Kayla was in this much pain. Her tests and x-rays showed nothing was wrong with her. The doctor thought maybe it was something nerve-related. So he referred Kayla to a pain specialist named Dr. Nicholas Scott, whose focus was on identifying and managing chronic pain conditions. Kayla very carefully cradled her right arm as she thanked the doctor, and then she got up to leave. She hoped Dr. Scott would be able to help her, because she really didn't know how much more pain she could bear. A couple of weeks later, Kayla arrived at the Arizona Pain Clinic for her appointment with Dr. Scott. She hoped he would have an answer for her so she could get better and finally go back to her old life. Not only was she missing work all the time, but Kayla was also in too much pain to go hiking or fishing or really do much of anything that she used to do for fun. Kayla waited in the exam room for a short period of time before Dr. Scott entered. His calm demeanor put her at ease, but she couldn't help but flinch when he examined her hand, which was still swollen and still had these bright red blotches all over it. Once he was done, Dr. Scott asked Kayla if she knew what might have caused the injury. She told him about her busy night at the restaurant at the end of December and how her hand had gotten smashed in a door, but she didn't see how such a minor injury could cause this much pain and swelling and over such a long period of time. Dr. Scott nodded and told Kayla he could not find any tissue damage or broken bones, just like her other doctor. However, he believed she had developed a rare condition called Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, or CRPS, that can develop after there's been nerve damage. He explained that a nerve in Kayla's injured hand was misfiring and sending signals to the brain that she was in extreme pain, even though the original hand injury was not that bad. Dr. Scott told Kayla that there was no cure for CRPS, but they could find a way to manage the pain and the burning sensation until it went into remission. 
Now, it usually went into remission after only a few months, but unfortunately for some, as the doctor explained, it could take a few years. Dr. Scott said they had no way of knowing which group Kayla would fall into. Kayla was relieved that Dr. Scott had a diagnosis, but the possibility of living with such excruciating pain for years on end was terrifying. She just hoped that the doctors and her medical team could somehow get this pain under control and get her back to normal life soon. About nine months later, on December 16th, 2016, Kayla was in her kitchen struggling to cook some dinner. None of the pain treatments that Dr. Scott tried had worked. Over the past few months, the horrible burning pain in her right hand and arm had spread across her feet, hips, knees, neck, even her head. Basically, Kayla felt like she was on fire 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Kayla had lost count of how many times she'd been to the emergency room, but no matter what the doctors tried, the pain never lessened. She could barely get out of bed, she'd had to quit her job, and now she was relying on her family to help her financially. Kayla had worked so hard for so long to build her life, and now it was all crumbling all around her, and it seemed like there was nothing anyone could do to help her. Even worse, really dark, depressing thoughts began to cloud her mind every day. All she wanted was for the pain to end, even if that meant falling asleep and never waking up again. But Kayla was determined to try to find some ray of hope in her life, and she knew she got a lot of comfort from her family. So she had decided to invite them all over for a Christmas celebration where she would prepare a meal for everyone. And as she struggled to clear some dishes from the counter, Kayla happened to notice what looked like a fresh burn on her forearm. She tried to remember how she did this, you know, maybe she bumped into the stove or something and didn't notice, but she really had no memory of getting a burn. Thankfully, though, the burn was small and didn't get any worse, and so Kayla was able to successfully host her Christmas party. It was only a small get-together, but the visit really lifted Kayla's spirits. But on the morning of December 20th, so four days after that Christmas party where she noticed that burn on her arm, Kayla woke up to find that her forearm, from hand to elbow, was now completely covered with these small circular burns, just like the one she had noticed four days earlier. They looked like someone had stuck her with a white hot poker, leaving behind bright red blisters. But obviously that wasn't happening. These burns were somehow forming from underneath her skin. Kayla was shocked and she lifted her arm up to get a better look. When she flexed it at the elbow, the movement caused the burns to crack open and start to bleed. It hurt so much Kayla couldn't even think. She immediately laid back down and kept her arm at her side to avoid causing any more damage. Horrible thoughts began to fill her mind as she lay there in bed that morning. Kayla imagined grabbing a sharp knife and just cutting her arm off to escape the pain. She kept thinking about the incredible relief that would bring her. But then she realized cutting her arm off would be pointless because she knew from experience that these horrible pains she was experiencing would always eventually travel to the other parts of her body. Kayla gritted her teeth and then reached for her cell phone and called Dr. Scott. He was astonished by her alarming new symptoms. People with CRPS did sometimes develop burns like this, but Dr. Scott knew that was incredibly rare. In fact, it happened so infrequently within CRPS patients that nobody knew how to make it stop. So for now, the only advice Dr. Scott could give was for Kayla to get to the emergency room and hope the doctors there could do something to treat her burns. When Kayla hung up, she just started crying. She was in so much pain, she was so uncomfortable, and she knew that she was going to go to the hospital because she was going to do what she was told, but she knew they were not going to be able to help her. No one could. Kayla was right. The doctors at the emergency room when she got there were totally baffled by her condition. The only burns like this they'd ever seen were from cancer patients going through radiation treatment. Whatever was doing this to Kayla was coming from inside her, and they just couldn't explain it. Kayla left the emergency room and headed home, still in total agony and feeling completely defeated. The days turned into months, the months turned into years, and at times, Kayla's situation felt completely hopeless. Somehow, she always found the strength to keep going despite the unbelievable pain she was always in. 
By February of 2019, over three years after she crushed her hand, Kayla had gone to over 50 different doctors and had tried almost as many medical procedures, but nothing had worked. Finally, though, on what felt like her millionth trip to the hospital for the burns that covered her body, the doctors were at least honest with her. They knew they couldn't help her, and they told her that, but they could at least tell her what was ailing her. She didn't just have CRPS. She had the worst case of CRPS they'd ever seen, and perhaps one of the worst the world has ever seen. Most people who suffer from complex regional pain syndrome have symptoms in a single arm or leg. Unfortunately for Kayla, she suffered from symptoms across her entire body. In other words, she had a unique version of this very rare disorder. One doctor described it as stage four, the most severe and painful form of CRPS. Kayla had long since learned why doctors sometimes call CRPS the suicide disease, but the doctor spelled it out in agonizing detail. The pain experienced by victims of CRPS can be worse than childbirth, broken bones, or even amputations. The suffering can get so intense that up to 40% of CRPS victims express a desire to want to kill themselves to get rid of the pain. Kayla winced at that last detail because she knew she fell into that 40%. She had had those dark thoughts. And in fact, lying in the hospital bed at that very moment, she couldn't help but think about dying and how really it would be so much easier to just die because then she wouldn't feel the pain and she'd stop being a burden to her parents and family. Over the next few days, doctors and nurses streamed in and out of Kayla's room really just to see the patient with the extraordinary case of CRPS. Some even took pictures of her just for documentation. Kayla started to feel like she was not really a patient and more of an animal in a zoo exhibit. Then eventually, Kayla's doctors discharged her from the hospital after this latest flare-up subsided, but they were unable to offer any further relief from her crippling full-body pain. A short time after Kayla returned home after that millionth visit to the doctor, something remarkable happened. All of a sudden, for no clear reason, the pain just started to lessen. At first, Kayla hardly noticed, but by April of 2019, she felt noticeably better. By the end of the year, she was no longer covered in those burns and was feeling almost like her old self again. Finally, after almost four years of just pain and misery and torture, Kayla's nervous system had healed enough to properly transmit signals to her brain, which meant she was more or less back to her normal self. Although her CRPS will never be completely gone, Kayla was able to return to an active life. She went back to work at a restaurant, and she was recently honored with an award for excellence as a manager. On the evening of June 20th, 1965, four high school friends set off for a remote desert location about 90 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada, that was within the very famous Death Valley. They arrived at their destination, which if you didn't know any better, would just look like the middle of nowhere in the desert. But to them, they knew exactly where they were. And so they parked their car, they got out, and they began unloading very heavy underwater diving equipment and began walking it up a nearby hill. The group was made up of 19-year-old Paul Gian Contieri, his brother-in-law, 20-year-old David Rose, 19-year-old Bill Alter, and his younger brother Jack, who was 16 years old. As these four boys walked their diving equipment up this hill, they were hit with sign after sign after sign that was telling them, do not go any farther, turn around. They made it to the top of the hill and they were met with a huge fence, which once again said, do not go any farther. Without any hesitation, they went right under the fence and began walking down the other side, which was a very steep 30 foot rocky slope that led down to this very narrow strip of water that was the entrance to a very famous underwater cave called the Devil's Hole. Their plan was to dive all the way down to the bottom of the cave, which was at 325 feet. So they get down to the bottom of the hill and they begin putting on their scuba gear and Jack, the youngest, He's like, you know what, guys, I'm having second thoughts. No, I don't want to do this anymore. And they're like, all right, hey, suit yourself. And so Jack volunteers himself to sit on the outside and be their lookout. The other three, Paul, David, and Bill, they're totally still doing this dive. And so they put on the rest of their equipment. They hop in the very warm water. It stays at about 92 degrees Fahrenheit year round inside of Devil's Hole. They check their flashlights a couple of times. And when they're ready, 
They signal to each other and they begin their descent down into the dark abyss that is the Devil's Hole. So for the next couple of hours, Jack just sat on the surface waiting for his brother and his two friends to return. And just after midnight, David and Bill did return, but Paul didn't. And so when David and Bill got to the surface, they asked Jack, hey, have you seen Paul? Because we got separated on the way up and we, we figured he was already up here. And Jack said, no, it's just you two. I, I haven't seen Paul. And so David and Bill look at each other and they know they have a problem. And they're like, we got to go back down. And so they put the regulators back in and they turn and start swimming down. Bill would say when they went back down to look for Paul, Dave was leading and Dave was going really fast to the point where Bill couldn't keep up with him. And you got to remember, it's pitch black down there and Bill's got his flashlight. That's the only way he can see Dave. And Dave was creating separation and getting farther and farther away. Bill had no way to stop him. And at some point he lost him. Dave was just gone. And so Bill, not wanting to turn this into an even bigger problem, stopped where he was and went back to the surface. And he and his brother Jack just sit there anxiously waiting for Dave and Paul to return, but they don't. And so at some point, Jack went and got authorities. When the police got the report about the two missing divers inside of Devil's Hole, I'm sure on some level they were like, that's why the signs are there. You're not allowed to dive in there. But they put that aside and instead they contacted a guy named Jim Hoots, who was a professional diver who regularly dove inside of Devil's Hole. So he's very familiar with it. And they got him on scene within a couple hours to go looking for these guys. And originally the hope was Paul and David had found their way into a section of Devil's Hole called Brown's Room, which was this big air pocket that perhaps in an emergency situation, they had found their way in there and now they're trapped. So Jim and his dive partner get to the the edge of Devil's Hole, they put on their gear, they hop in the water and they begin their descent. And it's totally dark, they got their lights and they go down about 90 feet to where the tunnel basically funnels down to a point. And through this point, you have to wriggle through and push through. Once you get through that, you enter into this massive chasm that if you shine your light in any direction, the walls are so far away that initially it looks like you're shining a light into infinity. It's this massive, massive space. But for them to get to Brown's room, the first place they're gonna look for these guys, they needed to push through that little funnel and then immediately turn left and track the ceiling until they find a tunnel that goes back up again. And that is the tunnel that's very claustrophobia inducing. It's very tight that if you take it 90 feet back up, you get to Brown's room and that's that big air pocket. And so Jim and his dive partner, they make their way up this tunnel, they get to the air pocket and there's no divers. And so they go back down through the tunnel, back into that huge chasm. And instead of going back to the surface, they knew that if they didn't find them in the air pocket, they were gonna go down a little ways and see if they could find them on this one area called the lower ledge. And so the lower ledge was just a rocky outcropping that was about halfway down to the bottom of the cave. It was a natural break point before you went to the bottom. And so as they're descending in this infinity chasm, Jim is shining his flashlight in every direction looking for signs of these guys. And at some point his light picks up a reflection on the lower ledge. And so they get down to the lower ledge and that reflection was from a dive mask, the, the glass of the dive mask. It was sitting right on the lower ledge and then next to it was a single dive fin. So Jim and his dive partner, they pick these items up, they go back up to the surface and they confirm with Jack and Bill Alter that yes, that mask and that fin belong to Dave and Paul. And then afterwards they say to the search party, look, we were in Brown's room and they weren't in there. And so there's nowhere else they could be alive. And by now they've run out of air. And so that mixed with the fact that we're finding their equipment strewn about the chasm, it's safe to say they're more than likely deceased. Jim and his dive partner said, look, we'd like to go back in and go all the way to the bottom. We stopped at the lower ledge, so we don't know what's down there. We anticipate we'll be able to find their bodies and we can at least confirm they're down there and then shift to a body retrieval mission. So Jim and his dive partner get back in the water. They go down the 90 feet to that little section you have to wriggle through to get into the chasm. Once they're inside, they keep going down, they pass the lower ledge and they go all the way down to 325 feet. Now this cave is huge and the floor bottom is huge, but it's not so huge that you wouldn't be able to spot two bodies that have just recently landed down here. And so Jim and his partner are scanning their light across the bottom, which is relatively flat. You can see pretty far because of how clear the water is and they're not seeing anything on the bottom. They're looking all over the place and there's no bodies, there's no equipment, there's nothing. And they're thinking, how are we missing this? How are we not able to see this? And it was at this point that Jim noticed a little hole in the bottom of the cave floor barely big enough for a full-size person with tanks to fit through that he hadn't seen before. And so they make their way over to it. And Jim says, right when he was on the edge, he felt a fairly strong current 
being pulled past his legs down into this hole. It was almost like this was a drain on a bathtub and someone had pulled the plug and now all the water is draining into this little hole. And so Jim and his dive buddy kind of push themselves back to make sure they don't get sucked in. And Jim pulls out a weighted piece of string that goes out to 932 feet. And he would use this if there was ever a tunnel that he wanted to go down and he wanted to size up how deep it was. He would extend the line and he would let it fall until it hit something and then he would stop it. And on the line were marks of how deep it was. And so he let this line go inside of this hole and it went all the way down to 932 feet without touching any surface, meaning it's at least 932 feet deep from that point down. So Jim just pulls his line back up and he looks at his dive partner and he's like, yeah, no, we're not going down there. Not only were they not equipped to go that deep, they also both knew if we go in this hole, there's a good chance we won't be able to get back out again because the current is so strong. So Jim and his dive partner go back to the surface and they say, look, we couldn't find their bodies. But what we think happened is they developed nitrogen narcosis, where you're in this sort of drunken state, you don't really know what's going on around you, and that suction slowly pulled them into this hole and they weren't really aware of their surroundings and they didn't stop themselves before they got pulled in and then it was too late and they were pulled down into oblivion. To this day, they've never found their bodies and scientists still don't know how deep that hole is. But in 2012, there was an earthquake in Mexico, so 2,000 miles away from Devil's Hole, that caused a tsunami to come through Devil's Hole. I don't know how that actually works, but the scientists say that's what happened. And so scientists believe that hole leads to an underground ocean that connects to other parts of the world as far away as 2,000 miles. Today, diving is still strictly forbidden inside of Devil's Hole, unless you're a scientist and they stay far away from that hole at the bottom. Off the coast of mainland Southeast Asia in the Indian and Pacific Oceans lies Indonesia, which is the world's largest archipelago. It's made up of 17,508 individual islands that if you were measuring from the westernmost point on the westernmost island to the easternmost point on the easternmost island, it would be 5,000 kilometers right across the equator. So it spans one eighth of the world's circumference. Many of these islands are tiny, uninhabited, and unremarkable. At first glance, you might think that about about one particular island that's located 2,500 kilometers north of Australia. And I would tell you the name of this island, but if I did, I would be giving away the island's secret. Living on this island are 2,000 people who are direct descendants of former convicts who were exiled to this island. And they share this island with a particular predator that is endemic to this island, who is a direct descendant of flesh-eating dinosaurs. It can grow up to 10 feet long and weigh up to 350 pounds, and its taste buds are so immaculately developed, it can taste blood in the air up to nine kilometers away. These creatures are so good at smelling blood and death that anytime there is a burial on this island, they have to put big boulders over the gravesite. Otherwise, these creatures will come running out of the jungle and dig up the freshly deceased and eat them. This creature's bite is savage, and they certainly have the ability to rip a person in two, and in the past they have, but they don't typically bite to kill. They bite to create a massive flesh wound so they can inject venom into the wound site. This allows them to not expend a ton of energy waiting for their prey to die so they can eat it. They basically bite you, poison you, leave come back within 24 hours, and then they eat you. These creatures are strict carnivores and have a voracious appetite where they will eat up to 80% of their own body weight in a single day. They've been known to bite goats and eat them whole by opening up their mouth and ramming the body of the goat into a tree to force it down their throats. But when goats and sheep and buffalo are not enough to feed their appetite, they start eating each other. In fact, cannibalism is so common that their young will hide in the trees for the first four years of their life, hiding from their own parents because if they're spotted by an adult, they'll be eaten. On top of all this, they can climb, run, and swim faster than a human can. These apex predators are called Komodo dragons, and they live on this one island in Indonesia called Komodo Island. In 2009, a 31-year-old fisherman named Mohamed Anwar, who had grown up on Komodo Island and was living there at the time, decided he wanted some fruit. He normally would just eat the apples that were right outside of his house, but he had always been tantalized by the sugar apple trees that were inside of the fenced off section of Komodo Island, the so-called forbidden section. This section was of course teeming with Komodo dragons. And so as a result, the locals basically fenced it off and said, we don't go over there, they don't come over here. But Mohammed had always wanted those sugar apples. He'd grown up here and he never got to have one. And so this day, for whatever reason, he decided today's the day I'm gonna get one. 
And so he goes over to the fence and he's looking out and there's some fairly tall grass. So he can't see what's on the immediate other side of this fence, but it's pretty open. Then he can see the trees. They're a little bit off in the distance. And so after looking around and feeling like the coast was clear, he hopped the fence and he ran out to the sugar apple tree. Muhammad's neighbor, Teresa Tawa, was outside and happened to look over at Muhammad right as he hopped the fence into the forbidden section. And so she ran over to the fence and yelled to him to come back, but he didn't hear her. And so she's standing at the fence, looking out, scanning herself to see if there's any Komodo dragons out there. And she didn't see any. And so she turns her attention to Muhammad and she's watching him, hoping that he just gets the apples and comes back without incident. And as she's watching, she sees he's reaching out and extending his arm just far enough. He wants to get one more apple and he loses his footing and he falls to the ground. From her perspective, she couldn't see Mohammed on the ground because the tall grass obscured him. So she didn't know if he's laying there unconscious or if he's just rolling around and he's in pain and he's about to stand up. And so she's just looking anxiously, hoping he stands up soon. And then she hears the sound of two Komodo dragons running through the tall grass. She can see the grass moving as these two massive creatures are running and grunting at full speed towards Muhammad. Muhammad, when he fell, he had cut himself and they smelled his blood and they charged over and Teresa could only scream and yell for help as these two Komodo dragons ate Muhammad. The authorities were able to get out there pretty quickly and they were able to get the Komodo dragons off before they actually consumed him but he was already dead. Today, you can actually go to Komodo Island as a tourist, but it costs you a thousand US dollars to get a membership fee. And then once you get there, you're only allowed to be in a couple different sections that are totally regulated. And you're really not anywhere near the Komodo dragons because it really is extremely dangerous. Pearly Beach is this beautiful little beach town in South Africa that's very popular amongst tourists. There's lots of snorkeling and whale watching and horseback riding on the beach. But behind this beautiful vacation town, down this bumpy access road going inland, you come to this unmarked settlement called Oluxalwaini that is like the opposite of a vacation. Basically, everyone there is completely impoverished. Beyond some seasonal cleaning jobs and the occasional gardening job, there's virtually no work in that area. As a result of this crushing poverty, the men in this town have had to take on one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. It's called abalone poaching. Abalone are a very rare type of shellfish that are illegal to be captured and sold, but there's this booming illicit market for them, their primary customer being the Chinese who view eating abalone as a status food. Abalone can only be harvested by hand, and one of the very few places you can find them is on Dyer Island, which is three kilometers off the coast of Pearly Beach. And so the men of Eluxalwaini have become the primary labor force to go collect these shellfish for this illegal trade. On a really good night, these Eluxalwaini poachers will come back and make the equivalent of a couple hundred US dollars. And they'll use that money to support their entire family, mom, dad, you know, grandparents, kids, nieces, nephews, everybody, because nobody else can work. This is like the one thing that generates money. So you're probably wondering what makes this particular job one of the most dangerous in the world? Well, I can tell you it has nothing to do with the actual act of removing abalones. That's pretty straightforward. It's the creature that lurks below you the whole time you're in the water pulling abalones off the reef that at any moment might come up and strike. In the early morning hours of September 3rd, 2017, a group of Eluxalwaini poachers met on Pearly Beach to make their way out to Dyer Island. Now, because they are so poor, they do not have the money to afford renting a boat to take them out to Dyer Island. And so they swim out to Dyer Island. It takes them about three hours to swim out there. And then they stay there for three hours, going down on a breath hold over and over again, pulling abalones off the reef. And then they swim three hours back. And so this particular day, the poachers are pulling up their wetsuits, getting ready for the swim, and they're chatting nervously with each other, doing their best not to talk about the one thing they were all terrified of, which is what's swimming out in that water. One of the men on the beach was a 34-year-old named Zalela, who had taken a break from abalone poaching because of how dangerous it was, but he had just found out his wife was pregnant, and so he needed the extra cash, so he was going with them. South Africa is home to the largest population of great white sharks in the world. Specifically, there is a stretch of water between Dyer Island and the shores of Pearly Beach called Shark Alley that is the highest concentration of great white sharks in the world. 
So every time the Aluxelwany poachers swam out to Dyer Island, they had to swim over Shark Alley, and then once at the reef, removing the abalones, that's where all the sharks would hang out because they would eat the seals that were in the area. So there's sharks all around them there, and then they would swim back over Shark Alley. So all in, they would be spending nine hours around some of the most ferocious apex predators in the world. So that morning, Zalela and the other poachers make it out past the breakers, and they head out to this stretch of kelp that covered the first third of their trip. Basically, they would stay in this big kelp field because they said the sharks didn't like to come in the kelp. But at some point, they reached the end of the last bit of kelp. And what was next was this open water swim up to Dyer Island. This would be the most dangerous part. And Zalela was the first person that was going to be entering the open water. And the way they did it is in the open water, they would intentionally space themselves out by a couple of meters in case one of them got attacked. The others would have a chance to swim away and avoid being caught up in the feeding frenzy. So Zalela leaves the kelp field and begins swimming across the open water. And then after a little bit, the next poacher, he begins swimming, and they had this practice where they would constantly be looking around and counting all the people they were with. Because these shark attacks, when they happened, a lot of times they would get pulled under the water and you wouldn't hear it at first. And if there was a head missing, you stopped and you stopped everybody else and you made sure no one was being attacked by a shark. And so as this second swimmer is swimming along, he's counting and he's got a full head count. And then he looks and Zalela's missing and he yells for the others to stop. And as they're kind of poking their heads up to see what's going on, Zalela reemerges in the mouth of a great white shark that is violently shaking him side to side. And Zalela's screaming out and the other poachers know they, they can't do anything to help him. And so they turn and they swim as fast as they can. And all they hear behind them is the sudden scream as his face would come out of the water and then go back down again and the violent thrashing of fins as a feeding frenzy began. And so the others make it back to the kelp field and one of them had a cell phone wrapped in rubber. And so he pulls that out and he calls one of the poacher boats because even in an emergency, they don't call the police because they can't jeopardize their livelihood. And so they call a poacher boat that comes over, scoops them up out of the water, and then the remains of Zalela that came to the surface, they were able to pull those into the boat and bring them back for a funeral. According to police reports, in the last two decades, five Aluxelwany poachers have been killed by sharks. But to the Aluxelwany locals, they say that count is not even close to accurate because a lot of times when people do get attacked and killed by sharks, they don't report it to the police because they don't talk to the police. And so they think it's probably closer to two or three dozen people that have been killed by sharks. When interviewed, an Aluxelwany poacher has said anytime there's a shark attack, whether it's fatal or not, they usually just take a week or two off and then go right back in the water. Poverty has given them no other choice. So that's going to do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the stories. If you found the secret in today's episode, tell us in the comments what it is and where you found it. Give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's videos and you haven't done this already, please go on a bike ride with the like button and then drive up next to them and jab a stick into their spokes at high speed.
Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I